Good morning, Ms. Pietzlis. Good morning. May it please the court, Judith Ellen Petrus. I appear on behalf of the Northwestern District Attorney, Elizabeth Scheibel, as well as the uh, Town of Hadley Police Department. And sitting with me today and on brief is Attorney Joel Bard. I am also presenting argument in the petition from the Hamden County District Attorney, William Bennett. Uh, that petition involves an identical order from the same district court judge for forfeiture and both matters were reserved and reported without decision by the single justice to this court and the matters were consolidated and sitting here today on that petition is Jane Davidson Montori. And what has happened in this matter is that the district court judge inserted into the statute language that the legislature had taken out in 1984. And in addition, the district court judge overlooked this court's express language in Commonwealth v. Goldman, uh, Commonwealth v. Brown, the, uh, the appeals, an appeals court decision, Commonwealth v. Ortiz uh, Peguero, and then in 2000, this court's language in Commonwealth, uh, I mean, Mazzoni. Mazzoni. And the Mazzoni case, I think, is perhaps the most explicit because where the presumption is that the legislature is aware of actions that this court has taken and interpretations that this court has made of statutes, you have the legislature taking out the language that the forfeiture proceeds are to go to the general fund but instead be divided equally between the district attorney or attorney general and the uh, police departments that are involved in the, the seizure of the items that in 1986, this court in Goldman says the order of distribution is as set forth in, in subsection What's D. What's the language that you say was taken out in 84? I the language, uh, it's from the 1977 Acts and Resolves, and it's that uh, the tail end of subsection D <coughs> used to end with the proceeds of any such sale shall be used to pay the reasonable expenses. Oh, it's expenses. in D. It's not, not language in B. No, it's in D. Okay. And what they did was take out the language in D where the balance was to be deposited in the treasury of the Commonwealth and they put in that the uh, balance was to be divided equally between the, uh, the two law enforcement agencies that were involved. One other factual question. Do you know um, in uh, Judge Ryan's opinions there's quite a long discussion about I take it it, it, it purports to be the history of this statute. And, um, and message, I mean, and mentions of Attorney General Bellotti. Is there something in the record where that comes from? No. Okay. That appears to be anecdotal. Uh, there was nothing in the record, and I've been unable to find any legislative history that would recount any of um, Well, certainly the, the District Attorney's Association, I thought, was very, I mean, or maybe it didn't exist as a, I thought it existed back then, 1984. Is that when this statute was amended? Yes. No, it was amended in 89. It was amended in 1984. 84. Well, it's been amended <coughs> a number of times, no, but, but for all purposes. Yes. This split, this important right. new split mechanism. I, I, I'm old enough to recall that there was some controversy about that and a fair amount of debate about it. Um, I'm just curious as to whether or not neither party has been able to find anything that would be helpful, enlightening, because I, I don't think the statute's so crystal clear. I was not able to find anything, but what I do think is crystal clear is that the way the statute, uh, Section 47, has been interpreted consistently is that the proceeds do not go to the general fund, but whether they come pursuant to a motion in B or if they come pursuant to a petition in subsection D, it still gets divided equally uh, between the prosecution and the, the seizing authority. and. At no time since the Goldman decision in 86 or subsequently with the Brown decision in 98 or with the Mazzoni decision in 2000 did the legislature say, oh, no, you've got it wrong. We only meant for the properties to go to the DAs if they went through a petition in D. Uh, the Mazzoni the district attorney of the Northwestern District in 1984 when the legislation was changed? I would think it would be, oh, wait, oh Hamden was Ryan, right? Well, in, it would have been Matthew Ryan in Hampton County in the Northwestern District. I, I don't know if that would have predated, if that would have been John Callahan. Or could it have been now Judge Ryan? I, Judge Ryan left in the. Judge, your, in, your co counsel. It was Judge Ryan? Okay. I, thought I, think, he might I have think we can take judicial notice that. of who was serving when we'll, we, we may do that. I, I take it, Ms. have you looked for the statutes of history? Yes, and I, I was not able to find any have legislative you dug history in the acts and resolves. Have you dug around in the state archives, which are what? No. 
Okay, I mean, maybe our law clerks could go dig around there because usually th uh, that's, that material is usually filed somewhere. Well, I mean, I'm not suggesting that yeah. you should have done that, but, but it may be um, if the legislative history is as uh, Judge Lyon suggests that it is, we should be able to find that out. Well, it's unfortunately been my experience that many times my expectations of extensive mm. legislative history have been unfounded. Ah, but you don't have two full-time law clerks working no, for you. I no, I do not. Oh, and I've <laughs> lamented that often, too. Uh, what I did find, though, because I was struck um, anew as I looked at the uh, brief from the respondents, is that they're making the same um, multi-purpose use of the term commonwealth as we have stated has happened in section 47 because in their brief they indicate that the ortiz Pagero forfeiture went to the commonwealth and they specifically say i.e. the general fund because the decision says that the forfeiture went to the commonwealth but in fact taking a look at the appendices that were filed in that case and are available at the social law library on microfilm the defendant very kindly put in both uh, a motion for forfeiture of property that had been filed by the DA's office, and that expressly says that the requesting that the sum be forfeited to the office of the district attorney of Bristol County. And in fact, that's an endorsed motion that's endorsed on the same date and by the same judge that the uh, opinion references. And also the order of forfeiture for the automobiles is that it be forfeited to the Bristol County District Attorney's Office. I took a look at the um, brief and appendices in the Commonwealth v. Goldman case, and unfortunately there uh, they weren't as clear because it just said that the, uh, the Commonwealth moved for an order of forfeiture and forfeiture was granted to the Commonwealth. And there was nothing that I could find that had been on file with this court in, those, in that appeal that made it clear who exactly the Commonwealth was in that instance. But presumably I, I, I can't it is remember how year. you introduced yourself this morning, but you frequently say on behalf of the Commonwealth. Today, you might have said on behalf of the Northern District. I, I think I well, try to be sure, very but careful. But I mean, often we use right. the term. But, but, but 47D itself uses Commonwealth uh, in lieu of, I mean, after, in that section referring to either the district attorney or the attorney general. I mean, so it, it does get used. Oh, so, so oh, it, it certainly is used, used interchangeably. It. F1 uses uh, the fact that it's, you know, uh, it's the district attorney or the attorney general can only be the ones that would be making the motion for an ex parte order for protection. Uh, B uses the order that by motion, you know, the Commonwealth can go and clearly there. It, it would not be the general fund coming in to move. It would only be the district attorney or the attorney general. And I think the public policy rationale for it uh, is in keeping with what the legislative intent was, that not only have they not changed it after being told repeatedly by the uh, intermediate appellate court in this court that the proceeds are going to be divided uh, between those two entities, but they have subsequently enacted other statutes making it very specific, either that the forfeiture is going to go to the general fund or that it's going to go to the, uh, drunk driving, uh, you know, the helmet law. There, there are a number of uh, programs that are equally as logical as to why it is that the ill-gotten gains or the um, mechanisms for drug dealing should be going to law enforcement agencies directly. That, that actually can cut both ways, though. I mean, because B is totally silent. So, I mean, you could look at the silence and, and the later very specific statutes as supporting the district court's argument, couldn't you? I don't believe that that would be accurate because that would go contrary to the rules of statutory construction, which are we don't put in words that the legislature is seen not fit to do. In 1984, they amended the statute, and they very clearly set out a method of distribution of the proceeds from forfeiture. And then subsequently, in a very short period of time in 1986, when this court addressed it, they didn't say, oh, that's not right. You know, we're looking at B. Oh, and I agree with that. I'm just talking about referring to other statutes that have since this been mm -hmm. very specific about where the money goes. I well, I think for the legislature now to have come in and to have amended B to just reiterate that which is already set forth in subsection D would really would be needlessly repetitive. And so once it was determined by the legislature in seeing this court's rulings that what it intended to do was in fact how the statute was being interpreted they saw fit to come back at various times subsequently to make different amendments to the statute, but were resting comfortably 
in the belief that uh, subsection B forfeitures were still going to the, the same uh, law enforcement entities. And I think this court can also take notice, as I was uh, shepherdizing this, there isn't another instance where there has been an appeal on a motion in B, in subsection B, that was sent to the general fund. Um, well, and to your, to your under, is it your understanding or experience that the, the, when these motions are presented, which I take it is relatively frequently yes. in the district and superior courts in Hamden and Hampshire counties, are they allowed and is the money sent to the district attorneys yes. and the police? Yes. This, it, this, this is an anomaly. Yes, it was. It was a very unusual uh, event, and as I reached out throughout the Commonwealth to see if other offices had this instance, I was informed of a 2113 petition that had been filed in 2004, uh, taking issue with an order out of the uh, Boston Municipal Court, and what had happened there was uh, my understanding is that a motion for reconsideration was filed, and the judge vacated the order, made the distribution to the uh, law enforcement entities, and that 211.3 petition was withdrawn as being moot. And there is one reported decision out of the Superior Court on a subsection B motion that I was able to find, and that was from 1998. And the subsection B uh, motion was granted, but the proceeds were uh, distributed to the general fund. I was not able through Lexis to find any subsequent history on that as to whether there had ever been a motion for reconsideration uh, or what had happened. But when I talked with my counterparts throughout the state, nobody referenced that. Nobody was aware of that event. Do we know whether this was the first order entered by Judge Lyon? I mean, I can't believe he hasn't had a forfeiture order before, or maybe he hasn't. This is the first one in our district where he has sent this to the judge. No, no, I know it's the right. first one. He's, but has, is this the first one where there's been a forfeiture order? No, in all the years that he's been on the bench, no, because it, the, the court is correct. Uh, the subsection B motions are very, very frequent in, uh, so uh, in the district so in, court. So in prior cases, he's been sending it... This is inconsistent with his prior practice? This is certainly inconsistent with the prior practice in Hampshire County. No, 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 Frank with him. Con. I am not aware that he has ever done this before. This was to has every... Has he ever allowed a motion that directed the, 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 these items go to the, the district attorney's office and the local police? I do know that when he was district attorney, subsection B motions were filed seeking distribution to the DA's office, and those were granted by other judges. You would I cannot be amazed give you how any, one changes right. one's position but depending on the I can't give you any, any information <laughs> uh, as to that specific question as to whether in the past Judge Ryan has allowed subsection B motions and directed the proceeds to the DA's I'm not suggesting DA's. this happened, but perhaps wearing a district attorney's hat, a district attorney hat might say, can we pull a fast one on the judge? So that's okay. Well. Uh, anything else, Ms. Peters? No, I believe that it, um, there isn't a great deal of uh, case law that really has been dealt with this particular aspect of the forfeiture. And so I would just be arguing that the public policy uh, remaining consistent with what this court's decisions have been in the past and its interpretations and going on the standard principles of statutory construction. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Mr. Sullivan? Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. May it please the Court, uh, Daniel Sullivan, uh, Special Assistant Attorney General for the Eastern Hampshire and Springfield District Courts, and with me this morning was my colleague, uh, Brian Mulcahy. Your Honors, there are two reasons that the District Court's ruling should be upheld. First, the language of uh, section, Chapter 94, Section 47, uh, 94C, Section 47, makes it clear uh, that uh, what basically what the DAs are asking you to do is to read into subsection B all of the dispositional provisions of subsection D. Well, uh, it is true, though, isn't it, that, that the cases of this court, they haven't specifically addressed dispositional provisions, but subsection D's procedures have very much been read into subsection B, and Mazzoni seems to treat them as one and the same. Your Honor, I, I would argue that, that those pr procedures have only been read into subsection B when it was necessary to ensure adequate procedural due process for the defendant. The, the, uh, That's, that, that, in fact, has been done by every other judge in the state that's handled these motions. 
Well, that, which is, I'm not sure that that uh, can guide us, Your Honor. I, I, I think that, I think that uh, Judge Ryan's uh, reading of the, um, of the statute was very careful. Uh, it's, it, the the don't, notion that you would just import. Uh, no, don't you think Mazzoni basically suggests that's exactly what you do? I, I, don't, I don't read it that way, Your Honor. Uh, she, the, Hamden, the, the district attorney from Hamden County quotes Mazzoni uh, that this court has said that forfeited funds are deposited into the existing trust fund and not deposited into the general fund. But that, in that quote, they're talking about a subsection D disposition. Mazzoni was, was concerned with a subsection D disposition. It was not concerned with a subsection B disposition. It was not in the district court. It, in it was. Was it? it? It was actually talking about a, a proposed amendment to the law, but it, in describing 47, um, well, move on. I, I can find the language. That, that, I think that's, it's more general. But. That, 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 that's my, the way I read the case, Your Honor. Uh, and, and for that reason, I don't think it's, it provides any presidential value with respect to subsection 47B. Uh, the, uh, aside from the statutory reading, and as I say, I think that the only basis for importing provisions of subsection 47D into 47B is if that's necessary to protect the procedural uh, due process of uh, rights of the forwarding party. Um, and in, in Goldman, for example, uh, the court, uh, first of all, the court found that, well, you can't have a subsection D uh, petition uh, w w uh, independently of subsection B. But what the court did not find uh, was that uh, all of those provisions came into subsection B with subsection, uh, uh, from subsection 47D. The court, however, in the Brown case, for example, it was asked to import the notice provision from subsection D into subsection B and said in that case, we don't need to use those more onerous notice requirements of subsection D in a subsection B motion. Instead, what we'll do is we'll use the ordinary rule that's used in civil motions, seven days notice, and that's adequate. So in that case, the court didn't even find that it needed to import even the notice provision, a, 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 a due process provision from subsection D into subsection B, much less to import all these very detailed dispositional provisions. Uh, the, the other reason, and it's a, it's a, a policy uh, argument for uh, upholding the district court, and that is that uh, entangling the disposition of criminal charges with the forfeiture of funds to law enforcement agencies inevitably raises uh, the question of a quid pro quo. And this is, this is the problem that uh, Judge Ryan addresses at most length in his, in his opinion, which is that it creates an appearance, uh, I was thinking in particularly from the viewpoint of a co-defendant who didn't have any but, money. But this is, this is a legislative judgment. I mean, such appearances, I guess, are fine. But, Mr. Sullivan, the, the, same quid, the same quid pro quo could operate. I mean, if you said, let's just say there was no 47B, so the only way to have uh, forfeiture is through 47D. The district attorney can still bargain. It just means that the district attorney, as happens now, has to have an ADA go into the superior court civil session and file uh, an in rem proceeding. But it's, uh, the same bargaining goes on. The same quid pro quo can go on. Your Honor, the distinction I would make is that it's brought uh, not, not only in the case of a district court in a separate court, but before, before a judge who wasn't involved in accepting that plea. That's agreement. not necessary. I think you've got a difficult problem when you have a district court judge who's accepting, on the one hand, the plea agreement, and on the other hand, he's, he's but granting B a motion also of forfeiture to the district attorney. There's, an, there's, an inter there's an, uh, necessarily yes, a B, conflict. Doesn't here, Your Honor. B also apply to the superior court? Yes, but in that case, but, but, but in that case when, it, when uh, forfeiture is done under B, it goes to the Commonwealth. It goes to the, it goes to the general fund. It does not go to the... No, no, the, but what I'm saying, you're, you're saying, you're saying it goes to the Commonwealth and, 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 and part of the problem is that it's, it's unseemly because there's a quid pro quo. That's why it shouldn't go to the district attorney's office district under attorney. B, right? Yes. And I'm just saying you can bring, I mean, it happens in the Superior Court as well, that part of the criminal case, money is forfeited under under B, correct? Could well be the yes, same judge. Yes, but, but, uh, but it's not to benefit that particular office. Exactly. That's, that's the distinction. The, the benefit to the district attorney is much more attenuated if the money goes to the general fund than it is if the, if the, if the forfeiture goes directly to that district it's, attorney's it's office. It's completely attenuated. 
It is completely attenuated. He, ha he, he you know, the district attorney has an interest in getting this money, and that's what, what, what it, the, creates the potential appearance. And I'm not suggesting that this kind of uh, this occurs. I think it would be wrong if it did occur. I'm not suggesting it does, but it creates the 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 appearance that there may be a quid pro quo. As I began to say, from the standpoint of another co-defendant who didn't happen to have four or five thousand dollars in his pocket when he was arrested. What's he thinking about the the, the uh, plea agreement given to his co-defendant? Well, gee, he probably got a better deal. He's giving up four, four or five thousand dollars to the DA's office. I would think, from just from a practical point of view, that's the way it looks from someone outside the process. But let's go back to, to as we know, D permits the district attorney or the attorney general, in the name of the Commonwealth, to file a, a a petition or yeah, a petition in the superior court to get this money distributed to them, right? Yes. So, so is, that's what Justice Bosworth was saying. That's the problem. You say, well, it will go before another judge. I don't see anything in here about yeah. it going I mean, before if, another judge. If you well, have it's a, a separate proceeding, Your Honor. You don't have well, the same judge. It can be. It, 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 it be goes the to the court having final. Court? Excuse me. Goes to the court having final jurisdiction over the related criminal any related criminal proceeding. So presumably, it goes to the same court. Presumably, it can be consolidated with the criminal action or heard at the same time. Presumably, it would be. Well, in fact, in this case, we're just dealing with a district court disposition. Uh, no, but I'm saying you're saying the appearance is, is – so you're saying at the district court there would be more of an appearance than there would be if it were done by a superior court judge. Well, I, I think in the, 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 the notion in the superior court, the, the, the idea would be that the judge, at least in that – when he's sitting in that case, is not influenced by the other case. I mean, obviously, that assumes a certain level of uh, – uh, uh, discipline of thought, but I mean, it's, it's saying he's not in the position, from a public point of view certainly, of being in the position of accepting a plea agreement on the one hand and agreeing to give the DA, allow the DA the forfeiture money on the other hand. He's just looking strictly at the forfeiture, strictly at the merits of that particular question, as opposed to looking at it while in the back of his mind he would also be aware, well, okay, I've, I've accepted a plea agreement on behalf but of But you this, would concede in a superior court case, a superior court judge could do precisely that, look at these things together. It's a civil in rem proceeding here. I've got a cr related criminal proceeding. It, 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 could, it could come before the same judge, Your Honor. Yes, I agree with that. Well, in the details, if in fact there's a quid pro quo, that should be presented to the Superior Court judge in a plea. That's part of the plea agreement. If, it, if it's part of the plea agreement, it should be announced. Well, I, I, I would agree that it should be announced. I, 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 I don't know whether that occurs, Your Honor. I, I, Are you suggesting that, that in the Superior Court it's done sub rosa and, the, and in the District Court it, it's done all above board? I, no, I'm not making that distinction, Your Honor. I, 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 what I'm saying is that the, 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 import, the critical distinction is the fact that the money is going to that particular district attorney and not to the Commonwealth. That's, where, that's what creates the conflict. Uh, the, 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 uh, the trial judge, in looking at the forfeiture motion, even if it is the same judge, has to look at that in isolation and as to whether or not the, dr the drug money nexus has been made. Uh, and uh, th th that really has to be his focus. Whereas in, in a criminal case, he's looking, he's, he's been thinking about the case, he's been thinking about the evidence in the case, he's been thinking about what the defendant did or didn't do, and he's also at the same time making a determination, okay, well, we'll allow this money to be forfeited to the district attorney. It seems to me that those two uh, thought processes shouldn't be occurring in, in the same proceeding. But well, why is that any different than, I, 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 will, I will, you know, a, a, a part of a plea agreement that consists of Testifying in a case, or, or operating uh, as, as a, uh, as, 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 you know, to, to conduct control buys. It, it, what's the difference? I understand, Your Honor. I, I, I think I think that the difference is that it. Uh, I mean, if we're not talking about just plain old money. We're talking about money that presumably um, was used in, in about a car, or some, or perhaps even a house that was used in, a, in drug trafficking. We're not talking about paying for justice out of one's pocket. Well, I, I think that that would inevitably be the perception that the, that there there was the possibility that a more lenient plea agreement was adopted. Are, are you say, are you saying when people testify or when people cooperate as a cooperating well, individual? Well, in that case, they're contributing. They, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a determination made by the district attorney that the testimony uh, uh, is, is sufficiently valuable for the purposes of, of, of uh, convicting another defendant. Uh, to allow some uh, leniency on the plea agreement for, for the testifying defendant. In this case, I, I, don't, I think that is justified. I don't think it's justified for the district attorney to say, well, I'll get four or $5,000 from my office, and therefore I'm going to let this defendant who, has, who had that money and will forfeit it to me have an easier, uh, an easier plea agreement than I will another defendant who didn't, we didn't pick up with any money. I think that's the problem, is it creates a disparate uh, treatment of defendants who happen to be caught with money and those who don't. 
Mr. I Mr. Sullivan, if, if we if we were to import into 47B for these purposes, the, the you know the, the the protections of 47D, would that so then essentially you have the district court in the same position as the superior court? Wouldn't that take care of the problem? Because that you would have the you would have essentially parallel proceedings. Are you with me? Would, uh, <coughs> the notion that there could be a, uh, an, uh, an in-run petition in the district court? Correct. As well as now it's required to be in the superior court. Yes. I don't think that, I don't see that that, that would be a problem. It's not clear to me why the in-run petition has to be brought in the superior court. I mean, I, I, it occurred to me that it might be because of the limited civil jurisdiction of district courts. But I, I, I don't see so, any... So um, you are saying if, as long as it were an in-run proceeding, yes. a separate proceeding... Yes, Your Honor. But, I, I but, agree that, it, that but, that's the critical point, is that but it should this be court, a separate proceeding. this court has called it an in rem proceeding. In gold, one of those two cases refers to Section B as an in, this part, as an in rem proceeding. I'm, I'm not aware of that, Your Honor. I may, I, I may have missed that. I, I, uh, you know, <coughs> it's, is Goldwyn the first oh. one? It's okay. certainly not docketed as a separate proceeding in the district. No, court. it it's isn't. But the language, the language used by this court, I think, was an in rem proceeding. But I'll find it. It, it may be you are right. Um, Uh, and I, I just wanted to make the, the point with respect to uh, uh, my so, sister argues that. So uh, I mean, regard, I mean, I'm just looking at Goldman at the moment, and I can't, I, I can't see it. But regardless of uh, whether we called it an MLM proceeding, your view is that you have to have a separate proceeding, a civil proceeding, like D. And whether or not it's heard by the same judge, th that's not your concern, as I understand it. It is that it's not in the same case, and you and you would then say that if you had to, if you imported everything from D, everything from D into B, namely findings of fact, the conclusions of law, the linkage, all of that, that's fine. It's that it's it's that you've got it in one proceeding here. The, 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 uh, if if one were to import uh, all the provisions of D into B, right, then in, even under B, an in rem uh, proceeding would be required. Uh, the, the difficulty with that is that then there would be no way in which the money could be forfeited to the Commonwealth, to the general fund, as opposed to the district attorney. And I believe that that was the statutory intent, that they had two uh, separate provisions for that reason. There's no other reason, there would be no other reason to have these two separate subsections, frankly. Other than so, so, so viewed one way, if the money's going to the Commonwealth, you don't need all of these protections. If the money's going to the DA, then you, uh, on the split division, to the law enforcement agencies, then you need the separate proceeding, the link, you know, so. That, that's the way I read the statute, Your Honor. That, 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 that the thought was, this is an extraordinary disposition. Uh, and as, as Your Honors well know, uh, funds aren't ordinarily uh, appropriated to an agency without going through the whole legislative process of debate and, and veto and override of veto. Uh, and in this case, we're taking money, giving it to the district attorney, and the judge is giving it to the district attorney, and there's never really any oversight of that, with, except with respect to 10% that he can use for drug rehab. He has to report on that. But other than that, the district attorney has no uh, duty to report back to Ways and Means or any other legislative uh, committee uh, as to how he, he uses the money. It's but again, that's a legislative, that's a legislative judgment. That, and, right. I, I believe the legislative judgment was that in this case, because when the district, district court shouldn't be able to do this. That, 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 that's correct, Your Honor. Right. That it, is the superior the legislative history here seems to me to be pretty important because this was a significant change in 1984, an important one pressed very hard by the law enforcement community, understandably so, and I think it probably has done a tremendous amount of good in lots of ways. You were unable to find legislative history as well, or? I, I was, Your Honor. Uh, I, I know that I did want to say that, that, uh, that Judge Ryan was serving as district attorney in 1984, which I suspect uh, explains his, his intimacy with the details of that legislation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Sullivan. You, Your Honor.